The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. This episode is sponsored by The Op, also known as USAopoly. The Dice Tower, Episode 701, Beetlejuice. Welcome to The Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. In today's show, we've got games with butterflies and Sherlock Holmes and magic potions. And we're going to wrap up with a piratey game pie. Arr! Mandy made me do that. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. That was a very good R matey. <laughs> I, I, felt, I felt so much pressure, Mandy. I mean, you just made it so clear that if I didn't really pirate it up, that you would be disappointed it, in it, me. And I just can't have that. Wouldn't be authentic. We had to get the R in there. And I think it was pretty good. Pretty, pretty. And I think everyone will do it along with you. I'm telling you, people are going to read that and in their mind go, R. <laughs> it's piratey. Community building. Exactly. Got it. I like it. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. It is nice to have you here. Mandy, it's nice to see you after crushing you in caper. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't need to, we don't need to go there, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying. For those of you who missed it, Mandy and I did a live play of the game Caper that's currently on Kickstarter, Caper Europe. This is a two-player kind of area majority area control game it's so much fun and we did a live playthrough of it and i won't give too much details mandy put up a very good fight where we're competing to be masterminds you you were very mastermindy yes, mandy I tr- I tried. you did good <laughs> but if you want to check it out we had a lot of fun i mean mandy we always have fun playing games together right exactly of course i made a great chat to you know keep us motivated so can't complain So feel free to check that out. It's on the Capers Kickstarter page. I think their Kickstarter ends March 26th, but we'll keep the video up and stuff like that just because it was super fun. It's a really fun two-player game. It's probably worth checking out if you play two-player games. Absolutely. And everybody, this week's title poll, if you couldn't guess from the show name, it's going to be Michael Keaton Movies. (laughs) Why not? Now, let's be clear. Movies, not TV shows. Movies. So maybe you're a good old school Batman fan. Maybe you go back in time and you want to do Mr. Mom. Or maybe you like something a little more esoteric, like Jackie Brown or Much Ado About Nothing. Remember, folks, he was in Kenneth Branagh's Much Ado About Nothing. (laughs) Do you remember that, Mandy? I do. And there's another movie he was in. And I can't, it's coming, it, dupl, no, duplicity, multiplicity, duplicity, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. And I'm like, gosh, it's been a long time since I've seen some of the movies with Michael Keaton. And for me, I think it was great to see him in the newer Spider-Man movie as the villain. Yes. Right? I, thought, I thought that was a fun character. Anyway. Yeah. I won't tell you what my favorite is, but people who know me, there are two Michael Keaton roles that are just chef's kiss. Wonderful. I'd be curious to know if people know what they are. So... Well, we'll do our best to make sure the poll is fairly comprehensive. Yes. We'll use IMDb to create the poll and get it up there. So get your votes in. Give us your commentary. Honestly, we're just having so much fun with this stuff. <laughs> Actually, Mandy, I'm going to be a little surprised if your favorite isn't Beetlejuice. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That is like one of my favorite Michael Fair. Keaton movies. I love, love, love the scene. I don't know why it gets me every time where Winona Ryder is trying to guess, you know, his name. And she's like, Beetle oh, right. drink, Beetle orange, <laughs> like everything <laughs> but that. I don't know why that made me laugh. <laughs> that is, yeah, that's a great scene. So good. We'll see. I bet, I bet that's going to rank pretty high on the votes. I think so. Speaking of votes, last episode's title poll, Make It So, was all about the best Starfleet captain, courtesy of Eric Summer. (laughs) Woo, Eric. But I wonder if future Eric saw this coming, the poll, like the way it played out, maybe. That's some heavy duty timeline messing around right there. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, maybe looking at the results, I'm not really surprised. I don't think you are either. No, except for one. (laughs) 
Which one surprised you? Well, I guess it shouldn't surprise me, but I'd love to know who that one person was. But I, I will let you go. All right. <laughs> we'll okay. talk about so it. So Jean-Luc Picard took it overwhelmingly with almost 62% of the votes. Everybody loves Jean-Luc. Classic James Kirk came in second mm-hmm. with about 12.5%. Then Benjamin Sisko. Absolutely. DS9 Woo! at almost 10%. Woo woo, DS9. Honestly, I, I think it's interesting when you go back and you rewatch some of the older Star Treks and see yes. how they hold up. And different ones hold up differently. Absolutely. Um, and then we had Catherine Janeway after that. We had Jonathan Archer, which is interesting to me because actually Philippa Georgiou yeah. beat Jonathan <laughs> Archer. <laughs> Poor Jonathan Archer. And then the dark horse right now, I think, for me personally, is Christopher Pike. Because Pike was always part of the older Star Trek lore. Right. But then they've brought, with Disco, with Star Trek Discovery, they've brought Pike into his own as mm-hmm. kind of a fully fleshed character and his whole crew and everything. And now he has his own series coming out. Right. And I'm really excited for that series, personally. Because I thought what they were doing with Pike and Number One and stuff like that, I thought it was really, really fun in right. Discovery. So. Right. I'm excited to see. I, I bet I see, if we were to do this again in two years, I bet we see Christopher Pike higher. Oh, I think but so. But then, for those of you who watch Star Trek Discovery, there's one person, <laughs> one of y'all out there <laughs> voted for Gabriel Lorca. <laughs> what the? That's, what the heck, fire folks? I, I mean, I, I guess. I just, I was just surprised it was one. Like, I thought it would be none or like a handful, but just one was interesting to me. And, I do have a question. Now, just so you don't at me somewhere, I am not a Trekkie in any way, shape, or form. I watched uh, Deep Space Nine as a kid. I watched Enterprise as a kid. Uh, But, you know, I'm not... I don't know everything about it. I know very little, actually. Wasn't Scott Bakula on one of the series? Scott Bakula is Jonathan Archer. Okay! Okay! I just... Okay, I couldn't remember what his uh, uh, character was. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I'm like, okay, he's got back to that. Okay, got it. (laughs) See? I don't know. I don't... And I remember it was on TV the other day, and I was like, oh, these aren't too bad, actually. But then I remember people really hating on it. Yeah. And, I mean, obviously, in the comments, a lot of y'all were, I think, teasingly... (laughs) Razzing us about the captains that we left off. Oh, and boy. certainly there are strong opinions about Star Trek captains. But it was really fun because I think it was clear some of us have nostalgia for different captains. And I think as we were just kind of talking about, there seems to be a general recognition how contextual mm-hmm. Star Trek tends to be. And it meets the moment that it's produced in. Right. But sometimes those moments, like the the relevancy changes over time. And it's fun to see some of that come through in your comments in the thread. So thank you, everybody, for voting in the Eric Summerer generated <laughs> best Starfleet captain poll. We appreciate your votes and all your comments. And I look forward to seeing what you have to say about Michael Keaton. Oh, it's exciting. Now, Mandy, why are you showing me all these cards? What the heck are you doing with playing cards? So, funny story. I've been on Kickstarter a lot. Surprise. And I recently backed, and I think, Suzanne, you did too, a solo RPG. And it mm-hmm, required yeah. playing cards. And I said, you know what? I used to collect playing cards. We we had a move, so gosh only knows where they are right now. Um, and I said, I'd like to you know, get back into getting some fun decks. And I recently ordered... Okay, don't laugh. Bicycle Cards makes a deck. It's like a unicorn deck. And I know what you're thinking, right? Okay, who cares? No, but they're like holographic edges, you know, cute unicorn illustration. But here's the here's the gimmick here. You any of you have read or watched the movie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? In that, they show you what they do is you get there they have 10 decks that have purple edged cards the cards the regular ones have like a holographic edges right and i was like ooh, i want one of those those uh, oh no purple is this edge. like golden ticket time yes so when you open it it's like the golden <gasps> oh, ticket no. from the chocolate bar and you're like yes i'm going to the chocolate factory in this case you'd get the purple edged cards Sadly, I did not get a case of the purple edge cards, but the holographic ones are just as cute. So I had to share that with you because I was really excited. And I also got another stargazing deck, which is super cute. So I would love to know. And you can put this anywhere, social media, any kind of thread that we have up. I would like to know 
Are you a collector of playing cards? And if so, what are your favorite playing decks? Art-wise, I'm curious to know. So there you go. Very excited. It's true. If I don't know if folks have looked at what Bicycle's doing with playing cards or other card mm. manufacturers too, but these art and artistic decks of cards are gorgeous, and there's so many out there. So I like your unicorn cards. I'm sorry you didn't get your golden ticket, Mandy, but <laughs> oh, next time. Next they're time. still very, very cute. <laughs> Now, you keep on telling me that you played a game that you think my kids will like, so I want to hear all about it, okay? Uh, yes, let's, let's dive in. So, what have you been playing lately? Well, looky, looky, I have three games to talk about this week. I know. You've been busy. It's, it's, it's been a while, <laughs> but I've been doing a lot of solo plays, so I said, okay, here we go. So... First up on the list is a game called Dive. So just before I talk about it, the copy I received is a prototype. It is, I think, uh, will be available or is possibly available now in Europe, uh, not yet in North America. So that is to come probably April. Dive is designed by Romain Catergijan and Anthony Perron. And art is by Alexandre Ben... Sorry, Alexandre Bonvalo. And it's published by Sit Down... Sit down games, sit down. Um, I'm not quite sure. I think I've been saying sit down games. And it plays one one to four, so one to four players. And it plays in about 20 to 30 minutes. Price point uh, on their site, they're stating 24.79 to be exact, euros. And translated, that's about 37 <laughs> uh, Canadian or probably 37 US. I'm assuming it'll be the same price point. It's a programming game. I know. Wait wait till we talk about that. Programming game, simultaneous play, and push your luck. I feel like this is a Suzanne game. I don't know about the programming part, but the rest. <laughs> uh, you said programming. I love programming. Is it you? Okay, I couldn't remember. Okay, I'm the one who doesn't really care for programming. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You, did, are you saying you got us confused? Yeah, I know. Wait a minute. I just, it's like that never happens. <laughs> Sometimes folks out there get us confused, and I understand I that part. But wait, Mandy, you can't get us confused. <laughs> There's just too much, okay? Too much to remember. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay, so <laughs> dive. All right, let's 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 start. I got to talk a little bit about what the game looks like before I get into it. So dive is a game where you're, you're literally trying to dive down deep and find certain types of animals on these. I don't even know what you would call them. Clear. They say cards, but I find that confusing because they also have cards in the game. So unless you say the transparent large cards, <laughs> then it gets very detailed. But we'll just say that for you all to hear. So you have these transparent large cards type cards or tiles I could I like to call them and they have different animals sea creatures on them sea turtles manta rays whales sharks all kinds of fun stuff and there are some holes in some of these these clear tiles and uh, they sit in a tray so it's like a I don't even know how what size you would say that is think of two cell phones together I'm sorry that's the first thing that came to mind they're about that size okay give you an idea And uh, they sit in a tray, and there's a stack of them. And when you put them in the stack, you kind of have to rotate them and shuffle them. So, you know, they're all different areas. And then you put those in a stack. The reason why you have to do that is because that's what you're looking deep into. That's the water. And what you're trying to do, you uh, as a player, now I played this solo. So I played against the the village chief. And they had cards that get drawn. But uh, you're trying to program your, I guess, what you think is going to be on each tile. Because you're going to resolve uh, five tiles, or depending on how many tokens you put down, it could be four or three, depending. So you have a board that has these bubbles on them, and you have these uh, tokens that are numbered one through five. One side has a shark on it, same number, shark, and then you flip it on the other side, and it's just a regular number. The reason why you have the shark on it is because when you do a guess in that spot, you're going to say, hmm, this is the power of the number, because you want it to be higher than the other player, so you can win that tile. And then if the tile has a shark on it, you have to say that there's a shark on it by putting it on the the token on the correct side. So shark or no shark. The thing is, you want to make sure you're right. Because if you're not right, let's say there's a shark, you pull off the tile, we look at it and resolve it. And there's a shark, but your tile says there's no shark, even though you have a higher number, but you said there's no shark, your turn kind of ends. So anything you programmed after that, bye. Huh. So you have to make sure, and let me just make sure, because I don't want that to sound confusing. So, first tile in the tray. We can't see them, right? Because we're all bunched together. So we're looking down. I'm like, hmm, I think there's a sea turtle on that first tile, but I also think there's a shark. 
but I really want to win this one because sea turtles and manta rays score us points. They push us forward on that track. Everything else doesn't matter. It's just there to confuse you. So hmm. I've said, hmm, I think there's a sea turtle on there and there's a shark. So I'm going to put my number four token on the shark side up in my first bubble spot because I think the first tile has a shark and the sea turtle. I played solo, so I, you know, I don't know yet what what uh, the chief has played because I have to program them all, right? Because you're trying to look at each one, but you can't touch them or lift them up. You just have to look mm-hmm. down mm-hmm. and assume where they are. Interesting. So after you do that, you flip the chief village card. They have some numbers in their bubbles and it's random, right? So you're trying to make sure you have a high number for those ones you think you know the answer. So let's say I put a five in that first spot with the, on the shark side. So I think there's a shark on it. And the chief village, his number is always right. Doesn't matter what side it's on because it's just going to show the number. So let's say they have a four. So then you take the tile out to resolve it. And you're like, oh, look at that. Sea turtle and shark. I would win that one because my number is higher and I have it on the shark side. Technically, the chief would be on the shark side because his is always right. But his number is lower than mine. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So then there you go. So then I would move forward on the track based on whatever the sea turtle movement gives me. And then you would go and resolve the next one. If I had gotten that wrong, high number, wrong side of my token. So I said, oh, there's no shark and there was a shark. That's it. Anything I programmed after that doesn't matter. I got the first one wrong. So. Wow. And you really, really, really want to get them right because anything that you got right counts as points to push you forward on that track. So if I got that one right, I'm only going forward one. Keep in mind... Any number still visible on the Chief Village, he's going that many points forward. So you want to try and get as much right as possible. So the game ends when you get to 23 points. You know, whoever is farthest past 23 will win. And this game also has a variance. So you can make it easier if you're playing with children and not maybe doing the shark tokens. You can maybe just play with the numbers versus, you know, is there a shark or no shark? So ignoring the sharks. You could also play with companions. I played with a sea turtle or a type of sea turtle, which allowed me to add one for a round for any sea turtle that I got correct. And then it goes away. So these are some things you can play. Or the f- most fun one is using a flashlight. So you can use your cell phone or a flashlight with the kids or whomever. You can't touch the tiles, but you can use the flashlight on top, underneath, just kind of trying to see through the levels to kind of have a better view of what animal is on each tile. So... That's a lot. It's hard to explain without seeing it, but I think you get the yeah, general Yeah, definitely idea. a strong visual element to it. Absolutely. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing, but that gives you an idea of how it plays. And again, I played solo. You'd be playing this with other people and you'd be simultaneously programming and then reveal and then resolve. Mm-hmm. At first I heard programming. I went, oh, good gravy. Yeah, I, I know it's not your thing. But I remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Haha, very funny. <laughs> so... I wasn't feeling that when I saw the description. Then I saw the art, which I really liked. I'm like, ooh, it's a sea theme I really like. Then I played it. So I did a a play solo of it. And I was like, okay, I kind of like this solo. Like, it's quick. And I have a problem with certain kind of perception things. It's like, oh, goodness. But I did really well on it. I was shocked, you know, because I started thinking about, okay, it's a darker color here. So that means it's probably closer to the top. And Like, it really got me thinking. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. I was able to add other things to it to make it a bit more complicated, right? Now, when I say that, when I say complicated, I mean slightly more difficult, which is like, a two. Like it's it's not on a scale of one to ten, it's like a two, right? It's not very hard. Mm-hmm. And I really liked it. And I think there's gonna be a lot of replayability with it because you know you can rotate the tiles, flip the tiles, change it in all sorts of ways. So it's never gonna become monotonous in the fact that, oh, I know what this one is, I know what this one is. Do you know what I mean? So the orientation of things will make it interesting. Right. Now, right. It's not a heavy game. It is meant I think it is geared toward families or someone who's looking for that kind of lighter type game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not I'm not a solo player. I liked it solo. Um, I still think it's a type of game that I think people will probably like the interaction. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it is playable solo. This is the type of solo game that I would play because it's quick, super, you know, fun in that respect. Sure. But I definitely think it it, it is meant to have some of that interaction, like families and kids. I think that would be really nice to get people together. Um, Over time, I'm concerned about components. I don't have the, the official the official finished copy. So I don't Oh, actually right. Know. You have a prototype. Right. So I don't know how that's going to be resolved. But I find anything that has like a clear plasticky finish, fingerprints, they get smudgy, they get foggy. Like, is this going to be like a maintenance thing where you're going to have to like clean these tiles off? I don't know. Like, do... I'm trying to think of other games that have stuff like that. 
And I don't know how much it affects it, but I'm just curious to see how they're going to finish those types of things off. Be curious to see how that works out. Uh, But the game itself, I enjoyed. I actually didn't find fault with it, other than the fact that maybe some of the components I'm just concerned of longevity. But other than that, I quite enjoyed Dive. So Dive, it's pretty good. I think that sounds, honestly, it sounds super fun to me. I love that (laughs) idea of looking down and guessing. I don't know. It'd be interesting to play with my kids. I don't. I don't know what they would react, how they would hmm. react to that. That would be an interesting test, but I don't know. I think it sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for the long explanation. I'm just trying to find a way to make it <laughs> so you can understand. So eh, hopefully that helped. It definitely did. Thank Good. you. <laughs> I'll be honest. I don't know how to segue from dive to the game I'm going to talk about. So I'm not even going to try. Cause, oh. But I have a roll and write game. I know, it's one of those trois dice. Now, this is theoretically a dice version of the game trois, which is a pretty well-loved Euro-style game. Well, here comes trois dice. And I know that when dice versions or card versions of larger games come out, sometimes people approach it with a little bit of skepticism, or sometimes people's expectations are perhaps a little askew from what pragmatically can happen. And there are a lot of reasons to do an extension or a sibling game to a popular title. And how they tie in together, let's face it, we've seen a variety of depth of connection between those games. But here we are with Trois Dice, designed by Sébastien Dujardin, Xavier Georges, and Alain Urbain. The art is by Alexandre Roche, and it's published by Pearl Games, and it retails in the U.S. for $25. What you're going to get with Trois Dice is a pad of paper, of course, your score sheets, a circular board with some notches in it, and then a bunch of discs, little cardboard discs. And they're red on one side and yellow on the other, or white on one side and yellow on the other, some kind of combination there. And some clear dice, which theoretically really plays in here. And what you're doing is you are, you're playing like a a rich person in France, and you're trying to gain influence and build up the city and contribute to the cathedral and, and things like that. Thematically, that's what you're trying to do. Substantively, on your score sheet, you're going to have three primary rows, a red row, a yellow row, and a gray row, which is associated with the gray or white color. And each one has a slightly different focus, whether it's kind of military fighting or religion or supporting the nobles kind of thing. You're going to play through, I believe, eight rounds. I could be wrong on that. What's going to happen is that these three clear dice and one black die are going to get rolled. And then they're going to be placed on these discs around that board where the discs fit into those notches. So you have almost a rondelle. A die goes on each. One die goes on each of the next four spots based on the value of the die. The black die nullifies a spot. So whatever disc that the black die ends up on, that one's yoink, yoink. The remaining die, the color of the disc it's on will determine the row of the sheet you can use. And the value of the die determines which spot in that row you can mark up. So one through six, and if you roll a three, well, you're going to mark off the three in the white row, for example. And I, I think that's why they use clear dice, because they're really trying to emphasize the idea that it's the color of the placard, not the color of the die that matters for when you're marking up your sheet. Depending on where the die is in the rondelle, you have to pay some coins. So maybe that die up the row is really, really valuable to you, but uh, it costs you two coins. Oh, no, you don't have two coins. What are you going to do? That kind of thing. So there's some interesting choices there. So you're going to take that action, and then these discs flip. Now, you do have a little indicator of what color is on the other side of the disc, so you can kind of plan ahead. And then you roll the dice again, and you do it one more time for a round. And then the discs rotate. You do it again. You're filling in the spots on the sheet. After a certain number of rounds, game's over, and you count up your points. Some things that I really, really like about Trois. I really like that rondelle. I really love looking ahead on these discs and going, okay, these are all going to flip, and that means it's going to be red, red, yellow, 
yellow. Oh no, there's no white. Okay, that means I should take the white die now because next round I'm not going to have a white die. I like that kind of little planning element that they threw in there a lot. This is also the type of game, one, everybody plays every turn. Again, I've talked about this at length. Roland Wrights are so great for simultaneous play, for keeping players engaged every turn. Twa Dice does that too. This is also one of those Roland Wright games. It's all about the combos. I love combo-tastic roll and write games. So for sure, as you're marking things off on your grid, maybe you're unlocking a new scoring element. I love that in roller. Demeter does this as well, where you unlock what you score. Love that element here. It's one of those things where as you mark off spots, maybe there's a little connector point and you get a bonus. Or maybe it's one of those things where you mark off a certain number of citizens at the bottom and then you unlock a freebie building that kind of thing. Working that system as you're looking at your dice and working with what options you get through the luck of the dice, I really, really like that. There is a system for you to mitigate the luck of the dice. There's these little flags you can get so you can spend those to change the values so that you're not locked in, so you're not totally beholden. Again, another nice feature of most roll and write games that are good has some form of luck mitigation. Twa Dice has that. I like the game. I just like it. It's super fun. There's some tokens for a more advanced game if you want to. I find the basic game also very enjoyable. There is an element where as you go a little deeper into the game, you start to kill spots, which ups the tension so much. Mm. So for example, when that black die ends up on a yellow tile and the black die rolls a four, guess what? The four in the yellow row, dead. You will never be able to mark it. So you better have marked it earlier or you better work around that kind of thing. That's an interesting tension point that this game adds that it basically shrinks your sheet and shrinks your options. I think that's a really cool element as well. Mm -hmm. I think Twa Dice brings a lot to the game. Does it connect super strongly to Twa, the board game? Kind of, I guess. (laughs) Do I care? Not at all. Twa Dice stands on its own as a lovely, thoughtful, roll and write game. It's got some thinking and some strategy, but it's not too heavy. You're going to be able to play this 30, 45 minutes easily. It's not going to drag out. It doesn't overstay its welcome. I think it's a real winner. Whether you like Twa the base game, the real big board game or not. Twa the dice game, solid, solid roll and write. Well, that's really, it's really interesting to hear you talk about that because I know I was like, oh, this sounds good. And, you know, I enjoyed Twa when I played it. And I said, the dice game, okay, that sounds like it could be fun. Whether it's tied to it or not was, you know, not, that didn't matter to me. I just wanted to know, hey, okay, I like the first one. Maybe this has some some fun elements. And I've heard a couple reviewers just really didn't like this one. So would you say that's warranted? Like, I'm not saying, I mean, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but... If, would you say, hey, this is a game you should at least test before you make that assessment? A hundred percent. I think this is a solid one. I don't love ranking games, but right. I'm quite charmed by Twa Dice. I love all the things I mentioned. Combo-tastic play. Everybody stays engaged. Picking some of the scoring elements, because you pick which royals you're right. going to score and things like that. Those are elements of a roll and write game I just love. Really, if you like the format, if you like those kinds of things in a roll and write, this is a good one to check out. Okay, that's good to hear because now I can, I can, you know, it's on the list. So now I can definitely say with confidence, okay, now I really want to check that out. So thank you for for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Okay, so, well, I like to start this one off with what in your language, and you can say this, I guess I would always like to know this. I always, I love learning about different languages. And um, what in your language is the word for butterfly? I really would like to know. You can, you can, you know, hit me up on the socials, <laughs> board gamer pin up on Twitter. I, I just, I love learning words in different languages. So the reason why I'm asking is because the game that I'm going to be talking about today is Mariposas. And Mariposas, as I recently found out, is butterfly. I think it's monarch butterfly specifically. I could be wrong. Please correct me in Spanish. And uh, I know what it is in French, papillon, <laughs> and obviously butterfly in English. But do you know butterfly in any other language, Suzanne? I, I do not. I knew French <laughs> and I knew English. French. <laughs> so that's, that's all I got. But I love okay. that question, actually. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. 
So Mariposas is designed by Elizabeth Hargrave. Art is by Indie Maverick, and it's published by Alderac Entertainment Group, otherwise known as AEG. It's for two to five players, plays at about 45 to 75 minutes, and it's priced at around $44. This game has a set collection, movement points, it's general gist. So in this game, and I'm actually learning things, so I highlighted this because this is in the description of the game, and I didn't know this, actually. I don't know if you knew this, Suzanne, but... It specifically says, every spring, millions of monarch butterflies leave Mexico to spread out across eastern North America. Every fall, millions fly back to Mexico. However, no single butterfly ever makes the round trip. I didn't know this. Did you know this, Suzanne? I didn't. I mean, I think it makes sense considering the lifespan of a butterfly. But I didn't know that. That's very cool. Yeah, so that... It was actually really fun. And we actually have a lot of monarch butterflies where I live. You see the little, you know, when they're little caterpillar things. They're so furry and cute and chubby on the ground. And they turn into (laughs) these beautiful monarchs. Anyway, uh, so that was an interesting fact. I'm a teacher. I love learning new things. There you go. So Mariposas, uh, you play it over three seasons. And it's exactly as the description uh, says. You're trying to fly your butterflies up north and then return them south in the fall. So back to Mexico. And you want to, this kind of reminded me a little bit of Village, where you have family members, the generations, you know, like you get your levels one, two, three, four. That happens in Mariposas, where you have butterflies that started the first generation, second, third. And you want to try and get them at that higher generation, because you're going to get more points when you get them back into Mexico at the end of the game. So throughout the game on the board, you'll have different spots that you can, you know, put your butterflies into, and they give you flower tokens. So when you land on one, you get a token. So you have cards that you play from your hand, and you can move butterflies, multiple butterflies, one butterfly, but wherever you land, you're going to get that flower token. Why do we want flower tokens, you ask? Because that's how we get other butterflies. When you station a butterfly close to, I've been calling them milkweeds. I don't know the exact that's what <laughs> location. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is? Okay. I, I, I've been saying milkweeds. But there are certain spots on the board where if you get your butterfly adjacent to one of those areas, you can now propagate more butterflies. So you need to have matching Okay, I'd be careful. You need tokens. If you have, depending on the level that you're trying to bring your butterfly to, so if you're a level two butterfly, you want to go to a three, you might need two the same, tokens the same. I could be getting the numbers wrong, but you get the idea. If you want to do it and you don't have the same, you can just use one more of what the cost is, but different flower tokens. So this is why getting the tokens are important, so you can get multiple butterflies, you stack them on the same spot, and then, you know, you can move it from there further in the game keeping in mind that at the end of seasons right butterflies of a certain generation are going to i don't want to say this negatively are going to fade away will no, no longer be on the yeah. board <laughs> oh it's so sad um and throughout the game there are different scoring like depending on the season you're in there are different scoring elements like for example if you're west coast of a certain location you know depending on the amount of butterflies you have there or depending if you have butterflies there you'll get the points listed on the card There's also a set collection element. There are cards you can get throughout the game. If you land on specific locations, it allows you to get certain colored cards, and they have butterflies and things on them. And then you get to roll a die, and the die gives you potentially a specific flower token or a wild, so you can get to choose which one you want. So after the end of, you know, and you get a certain amount of turns in each season. I think it's four. I think when you get to the last season, I think it's six, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, again, trying to get all your butterflies back down to Mexico. And then at the end of the game, you just count up points, right? How many butterflies you got back to Mexico, set collection you have with cards, any tokens you have left over, you'll get points for that as well. That's the game. And it does play in the time frame that it states. Now, I've only played it two players. Whoa! (laughs) What a rarity! (laughs) Well, we played it two players on a stream for the first play. And when you know when you're on a stream... It takes longer, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. you're chatting and someone else is doing the moving for you. And that took about maybe just under two hours. But that's with all the other circumstance. So I think if you were playing in a regular setting, I think it would fall into the time that is stated. So I like this game quite a bit, actually. I mean, not that I, I'll be honest with you. I went in thinking, oh, I think I'm going to like this. I like the theme. I like that for sure. Mm-hmm. I like the decisions it now makes when you're on the board. You want to get, you can't score everything. Well, I shouldn't say that. You might be able to score everything, sure. but in doing so, you may end up losing butterflies. And then, the end game, you're not going to maybe score as much. And I'm that type of person, right? Where I just never seem to get that end game goal. I'm all about end game. 
hard, hard, hard. Yeah, I'm going to score this card and this card and get the butterflies here. But then if you put them too far up, trying to get them back down can be problematic. So then you're left with maybe not as many points at end of game. So you have to find that balance, which I enjoy. And I like the fact that you can score different things during the different seasons. So you're not stuck just this is what it is the entire game. This is what it is the entire game. You have opportunities to kind of try and catch up, so to speak, based on the different cards that come out. I did like that. Some of the iconography, um, it's not... Like, if I didn't read the rules and I just looked at it, it wouldn't be super clear for not me. Not super intuitive, maybe? No, that's... You know, and that's a better word. It's not intuitive. And for me, I, I rely heavily on iconography. Mm -hmm. And I love games where I can just look at it and go, oh, yeah, like, I, I get a general sense of what this means. This one, like, you actually have to read it to fully understand. Otherwise, it can be a bit confusing. Mm -hmm. So that to me was the only kind of thing I was like, oh, that may be a little bit better. But I mean, that's a nitpick at this point. The art is pretty straightforward. I mean, I, I, I I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if I particularly care for the colors that were used mm. um, on the actual board itself. And maybe because I played it virtually, I found a lot of the butterfly tokens kind of blended with the board. Over like a webcam? Yeah, so I yeah, find it really yeah, hard yeah. to see. Now, in person, I'm sure it wouldn't be that bad, but I do find the tokens are very close to the colors that are on the board. And uh, for me, that was a bit of an issue to see. But keep in mind that I did play it virtually, so that may have had some bearing on that. But overall, the gameplay I thought was really smart. It's one of those games you have to play a lot. And when I say that is because you play it and you're like, okay, I think I, I, think I, I got that down, but then you want to play it again to do better. Do you know what I mean? I and that, we're kind of talking yeah. about this, Suzanne, with a video game that I'm playing, and it was like, oh, I didn't get the things I wanted to get, but then I did it again, and I did better, and then I did it again, and I did even better, and I feel like that's how this game works, and I like that. Yeah. Nothing is worse than a game that's like hard for the sake of being hard or whatever, and then you're like, okay, great, it looks like I'm never going to get better at this game. Don't like that. This game encourages that. So for me, Paraposas, I, I really enjoyed it, and I think I've been hearing from other people that they also have enjoyed this gameplay. I really want you to teach me this game. Can we play it virtually over a webcam situation and we teach it? 100%. Okay. Yes, Thank you. I, I have a, just so you all know, I have a win in my, my bag for this one. So now they're going to play Suzanne and maybe if Ashley plays now, you know that. Oh, if Ashley like plays, we're done. Yeah. Forget double it. Double loss. <laughs> yeah. Forget <laughs> that. I played games with Ashley the other day and we played six games and. Oh, Wow. Yeah, if you look at, I track the plays and it shows yeah. the winners and it's like, winner, Ashley, winner, Ashley, winner, Ashley, <laughs> winner, Ashley. I won one game against her and it was the one I knew and taught her, not, oh, so, it was, it was terrible. I'm, <laughs> so uh, okay, I'll be back taking my rightful place as the, you know, bottom of the, <laughs> of the group. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the games I actually got to play with Ashley Mm -hmm. It's Brew. Okay. This is a newly announced game from Pandasaurus Games, and they've just started promoting it. And thankfully, they have an implementation on Tabletopia, which is really easy to play. And I love that they've made it accessible that way. Mm -hmm. Brew is mm -hmm. designed by Steve Torres. Art is by Andrew Thompson, Jake Morrison, and Steve Torres. And it's going to retail for, it looks like $30, according to oh. Board Game Geek. Brew is called brew because you're brewing potions. Oh, That's okay. what brew is. It's potions that you're brewing. I think we, if you just hear the name brew, I'm not sure if people think of potions or if they think of something more like coffee or beer or something like that. Right. But Absolutely. this brew is all about potions. And it's dice worker placement, mm -hmm. which I just – typically really, really enjoy. So in Brew, you're going to be getting a handful of dice, you're going to be rolling them, and then you're going to be using these dice to go on different spots to take actions. And mostly what this game is about collecting resources and then spending them to make potions. You have a village board, which has some basic actions on it. And then you've got a, bu a bunch of potion cards that you can potentially make. You've got forest cards, and these are very colorful cards, and this is how the game scales. So you're going to have a selection of these cards laid out. These cards also have worker placement spots on them, dice placement spots. And then you've got some creature cards as well. Roll those dice, 
on your turn, place a die out there. You can place it on the village board and use one of those basic actions, or you can place it on one of the forest cards and get resources, or maybe you get a creature card or something like that. Creatures tend to be things that give you ongoing abilities during the game, but you're limited to three. And then when you get a fourth one, you can release one of those creatures and refresh what three you use. So that works very, very well. Now on these forest cards, the forest cards have resource spots for them, et cetera, but they also have points. And at the end of a round, after all the dice are out, you're going to see who has majority control of each forest card and whoever has the most power in a card will get to take that card and keep it. Mm-hmm. When you release a creature, if you have a forest card that matches the ele- the the season of a creature, you can release the creature into the forest for bonus points as well. So you get a little engine going there sometimes if you want to. After four rounds of play, you're just going to see who's managed to collect the most points through getting forest cards, through brewing potions, and through their creatures. It's actually quite a simple game but there are some intricacies that are really engaging first of all i think area control is always adds tension and it always adds conflict so that's the first Mm. thing i wanted to mention it is dice worker placement but there is absolutely player interaction on this one Mm -hmm. you are going to be fighting for control of these cards and there are actions in the game that are pretty aggressive so you're going to have dice that match the resources that are your color. And that's what you're going to be using to take control and things like that. But there are these neutral element dice as well. Those dice can come with special abilities. One of those special abilities is, hey, it's the water drop. If you use the water drop to get resources, instead of getting one resource, you get three. Oh, that's so nice. (laughs) Yay, resources. One of those icons is fire. And if you use that one, you're going to be placing it on top of somebody else's die to use that spot, but you also nullify their die. Woo! Yeah. And then let's talk about these potions. Potions do a variety of things, and they're worth a variety of points. Basically, you're going to spend the resources to get to brew a potion, and then it goes into your hand. No limit to that. On your turn, once per turn, you may spend a potion and use it. Those potions have a wide thing. Reroll dice. Oh, great. Reroll dice. Burn a location. What? <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're going to put burn token. Now you've blocked off that location. Oh, wow. That's a potion and a half right there. Oh, <laughs> what's a double potion? Ooh, the lolly. Swap two dice. Spend a potion. I don't know how this potion lets you swap dice. I don't know what magic potion lets you go. I'm going to pick up these cubes and make them flip spots. But they got one. And you time that, it is, I mean, you can completely change control of multiple locations with that one card move. So, all that said, I've really enjoyed my plays. I've played it at two players, and I've played it at three players at this point. It scales very well because of the way that you do the forest card count, so I like that element to it. If you do not like that kind of area control, direct conflict, I don't know if this is a game for you. You can play it without being super aggressive. Okay. But I think that's going to be up to your group's meta and kind of the personality of your group. And I think it's a better game when you are aggressive. I think it Mm. really fulfills the promise of the game when you're vying for control of those forests and using the special abilities and the potions in that manner. The art on this game is lovely. It's a very colorful game. There's some elements that I haven't talked about, like seasons and things like that, that you get into when you play. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very easy game to teach. I've had a lot of fun with it. But I I did play a game where the aggression kind of took somebody by surprise, and they didn't enjoy that element of it quite as much. So. I put that to the foreword here in this discussion, just so people have a heads up. I think it's a lovely dice worker placement game. I think it's beautiful. I think it's super duper fun, but I didn't mind the level of aggression. Mm-hmm. It kind of reminds me of a game called Kemet, where just everybody has to go for it. You can't turtle up. 
if everybody goes into the game with the same mindset and the same kind of baseline understanding of this is how we play, this is our aggression level, I think you'll have a blast with it. And that's brew. Now, Mandy, I don't know. I don't know about you. Well, it's funny. I talked to Ashley about it. And she said to me that it is just enough mean or the right amount of mean or right type of meanness. Uh, People are like, what does that even mean? Certain games are mean to be mean. I don't like that. Some games you're kind of, and I put this in air quotes, required to be mean to progress your gameplay. So it's not like it's a personal attack. Correct. Correct. Does that make sense? So I don't know if people can relate to what I'm talking about. I'm okay with that. Got it. So she said it would be like Aqualine level. Interesting comparison. Hmm. Right. So I don't know if you've played Aqualine, but it is a type of game where you you can kind of block people off, but it's in order for you to score, right? You're not doing it because I'm doing it just because. No, to do that would be stupid because you'd be sabotaging your own game right? You have to do it for you to benefit from it. So she said that that kind of level of mean is okay with me, type of mean, I guess you could say. So she said it would be kind of equivalent to okay. that All with right. brew. So that helps people. <laughs> cool. All right. Final. I left the best for last. Oh, I feel like that's a song. You went and saved the best for last. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh. So many memories. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and yes, a lot of the games that we talk about, you know, definitely these are ones we like. And I have to say this because I was looking, oh, we like a lot of games. Our time is limited. We can't, you know, it, uh, for me to play a game that I don't like just to play a game that I don't like is silly. So I try to pick games like, oh, okay, I think I would like this. And sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. This week just happens to be a game of, you know, lots of games that I really enjoyed. So this is no exception. Holler Tau. And this is designed by Uva Rosenberg. I realized I was saying his name wrong. You, Suzanne, however, were saying it correctly. Oh. So I have made that correction. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Art is by Lucas Sigmon and Clemens Franz. Slap on my wrist that I 100% didn't know right away that this was Clemens Franz art. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and it's published by Lookout Games. I'm just going to interrupt you here, Mandy, and say I'm so incredibly envious that you've played this. I punched it all out, and it's all bagged up, and it's ready to go, and I reviewed the rules, and I just haven't been able to get it to the table. I'm really looking forward to hearing your take on it, but I, right now I'm just kind of wallowing in envy. It took a while because I was like, oh, is this going to be like a caverna? <laughs> Which I sure. love, don't get me wrong, yeah. but it's a lot. And yeah. I had to play this solo, so it was even more of like, okay, gear myself to play it solo. And um, I don't want to give it away, but pleasantly surprised. So that, if that helps you at all to push you forward in getting this played. So the game plays one to four players, and it plays in about 50 to 140 minutes. That sounds really long when I say it out loud, but yeah, that's about accurate. And uh, retails for about $100. So it is up there with some of other Uva games. It's a heavy box. There's it's, a lot in that box. There's a lot of cardboard. It scared me. I saw it. And I'm like, oh, uh, okay. And then it said like expert level on the front. I'm like, uh, so does that mean I can't play this game? <laughs> like, <I'm laughs> please, confused. please. You're an expert. <laughs> So we'll talk about that, though, in a minute. And so it is a you know, strategy-type game. And as you know, the games tend to go. There's some economic farming, that sort of thing, uh, in the game. So definitely familiar territory. So Hollertau, I didn't know, actually, that this was a place. And it's in Bavaria, in Germany, is the largest hop-producing region in the world. So I love that I'm learning all of these things from games. This is fantastic. So... <laughs> As a chief of a small village, a Bavarian village in Hollertau, your objective is to increase its wealth and prestige. So now, you know, making it, hey, this is an awesome place in the world and we need to show everybody that. So I know Tom and Eric potentially had mentioned this in their podcast, so I'm going to too, too much detail. Right. But in the game, you, you know, you have a farming board, you're trying to farm different types of uh, resources on the board. And you also have access to other types of resources. Don't laugh. It looks like a chicken leg. It's not. It's supposed to be lamb. <laughs> so I kept calling them chicken legs. Oh, good gravy. Um, <laughs> sheep or, you know, lamb is a resource. We won't, oh, I don't like the fact that they have to go bye-bye, but that is something that you're mutton. going to see. Yes, mutton. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for, mutton. There are, you know, hides, there's wool, there's milk, you know, there's all types of resources that are going to be very useful for you. 
And why do we need these things, you say? There is this kind of house track thing at the top of the board. It's literally a house under, and there's a track underneath. And this is going to let you know how many workers you're going to get during a turn so that you can place on the action board. And you want to progress it forward to A, get more actions. But then there are also some other tiles to the right of this house. And you want to push those forward because underneath, if you get your house far enough over, there are points that are going to be visible. So you want to upgrade these quote unquote buildings and push them over, but it requires resources. So that's where your farming comes in handy because you need to get things on your farming board at a certain level in order to pay the cost to get these pushed over. And you kind of want to do it sooner because every round increases the amount it costs to push or upgrade these buildings to push them over. And just when you thought, oh, that sounds easy. No, 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 no. There are boulders blocking you from going too far. So you then have to get tools to move these boulders in order to move these buildings over and move your house over to get workers. Yeah, that's a lot. (laughs) That's just a small part of it. I mean, it's a big box Uva game. What are you going to do? Of course. And then there are a variety of cards in the game. And I played mostly with the beginner cards. I needed to build up my confidence here, okay? Because the first game, my score was a very sad 50. Yes, It's bad because they're saying, I think it's like a hundred points is like supposed to be the normal score, I guess you could say. So I was very happy when I managed to pull off an 87 later. So not a hundred, but better. So I'm getting better. Uh, But the cards, you can change them out depending on the difficulty. And there are different types of cards. You have some starter type cards. You have cards that give you like income through the game. So when you get to that income stage of the game, it's going to give you stuff, which, you know, resources or things like that. You have other cards that give you points. So if you can meet the requirement, you don't necessarily have to hand them in. You just need to have it at that time. Play those cards. Those are going to be points for you at the end of the game. So things like that. And then the action board has spaces to get you milk or trading we're going to say trading in sheep to get you some meat. Ooh. And oh, I feel so evil saying it because the sheep are so cute. We even named, uh, I had some you fellow don't people name on the them, chat. Maybe. You can't name them. It's not my fault. And I blame you, Mikhail, for this one, naming the sheep Pete. So Aww. now all I can see is little Pete in my in my eyes here when I see the sheep. So I'm sorry, Pete. Uh, but anyway, so you can use these actions to get these resources. And uh, you only have so many rounds to do this. Uh, based on a round board that tracks it for you. I think it's six rounds. Um, And any sheep that are on cards, when you go to flip them, well, they go bye-bye too. So you want to make sure that they get to the stable so you can have them for points at the end of the game. End of the game, you're going to check points in in resources, whatever you have left. You're going to check points on cards. You're going to check points on that house. Remember I told you about that, where that lands. Um, And I'm probably missing something else. I think tools. That's right. Tools also give you points. Because remember, you can actually, you want to use tools to move the boulders. But in that last round, if you use tools, they go out of the game because they are worth points at the end. So tools are a thing. I liked this game a lot. And if you're wondering, do I need it? Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes, <laughs> okay, let me let me be clear here, though. So I love Caverna. Caverna is one of my favorites. I love Feast for Odin. This one kind of falls... I don't even know if it would be in between that. I find it... Le- it's very rules light. So I read through it and I'm like, oh, the rules are very straightforward. Oh, might I add, nice little player aid for you. It's super clear. I find the iconography very clear on it. I understood it. It was very well laid out. I have to say, I was impressed. I I thought it was very clear and the rules were super light. It's the strategy, strategizing in the game that is hard and then upping the difficulty with those decks. That's where the expert level comes in. Depending on the cards you play with, we'll change the difficulty level. So, and they give you recommendations of what to play with. So I find it not as labor intensive as Caverna Mm -hmm. and not as many uh, components like, I can fit it onto a, like a decent size area of the table versus Caverner. There are multiple boards and cards, and there's a lot happening. You've got your own personal board. It takes up quite a bit of room. Feast for Odin, I feel like, it, you know what? I would say it kind of falls into Caverna being here, Holler Tau, and then Feast for Odin. And people are like, what? Feast for Odin has a lot of bits. Sure, but I feel the strategizing part in Holler Tau, like, it falls just under Caverna, because I also find Caverna very hard to score high in that game as well. Uh, so I like the variation that you can get. I like the fact that it's rules light, but still causes you to have that brain burn, because I think it still rates as like a three on BGG for weight, at least. So it's definitely up there. If you are an Uva fan, you're going to want this regardless. I mean, mm-hmm. I still don't have Fields of Ar- Arl, so... <gasps> 
I know. I know. Oh, my heart. I know. Oh, I know. No. Mandy. Oh, no. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know where that would fit in. So, Suzanne, I know you have that game of played it. So, when you play it, I would like to know where that fits in. All right. Oh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. the spectrum. And if Will you agree. Do. Um, but anyway, uh, coming back to Hell or Tell, I really liked it. I don't know. Um, I've, I've been hearing very good things. I think other people have been enjoying the gameplay. Uh, I, like I said, I like the variability. Really good game. Highly recommend you at least try it. I like it solo. And you all know mm-hmm. that I do not play, enjoy playing solo games. I've played it, what, four times now solo? So, wow. yeah, that should tell you something. So Hall or Tau, very nice game. Oh, Mandy. Oh, gosh. I wonder if I'm like, I'm looking at, I'm thinking about my schedule for the rest of the day and going, mm, I wonder can if I, I can it? carve can out a couple oh. hours. Ah, I'm so jealous. Okay. Yeah, because that's, that's what you'll need. You'll need uh, for the first game, sure. yeah, a couple hours. Yeah, of course. It's a good thing I have a lovely friend on call. Should I have questions? Exactly. <laughs> and to wrap up games played, something a little quicker. And yeah, we've got quite the mix of games I on know. our games played list this week, Mandy. I know. It's all over, all over the place. All over the place, which is cool. I think that's really fun. <laughs> Wrapping up with Sherlock Files, specifically volume three. I don't know that I've actually talked about Sherlock Files before, mm-hmm. but I have them and I've played a lot of them, not all of them. Right. But uh, yeah, let's talk about Sherlock Files because maybe at least one of these you've played with me. Yes. Designed by Marty Lucas Fellu and Josep Sanchez. Art is by Alba Argon, Amelia Sales, and Pedro Soto. And it's published by Indie Boards and Cards. The Sherlock Files are published by Indie Boards and Cards. Now, what the Sherlock Files are is a distribution, a repackaging and distribution of the Sherlock games, which are published by Enigma in Europe. And I know all this because I was actually trying to chase these down and trying to find English versions of them, only to find out, flash forward, that thankfully Indie Boards had picked them up. And what Indie Boards has done is they've packaged three cases in a single box. So volume one has three cases. Volume two has three different cases, etc. So when you're buying Sherlock files, you're getting the Enigma Sherlock games, but you're getting just three in a box, which is great. It's kind of the way Unlock has done these bigger boxes now where you get three Unlock cases in one bigger box, as opposed to the little individual deck boxes they used to do. Uh-huh. And Sherlock Files Volume 3 is going to retail for 25 bucks. So you get three cases for 25 bucks. Now, this fits into one of these escape room slash puzzle game category, but really it's more of a deduction and mystery solving game. I think it could be marketed against some of the escape room games, but really it's a mystery solving game more than uh-huh. anything else. There's not a lot of puzzles in it per se, at least Mm -hmm. the cases I've played. It's really more about going through the story, figuring out as much as you can, and piecing together what you think the facts are. Because what happens is you're going to get a deck of cards. It's just a deck of cards. And you're going to go through this deck of cards cooperatively. And then at the end, once you've gone through the entire deck, the game has this secret pamphlet and you're going to answer questions. You're going to answer 10 questions, and then your score will be based on how many of those questions you got correct, minus the cards that you shouldn't have kept. And that'll be your final score. The way that works is people are going to get handed uh, three cards. On your turn, you have a choice. Play a card face up, share it with the group, and that becomes a clue and more information everybody gets Or place it face down and don't talk about it. You know the information in your head, but you can't share that directly with your teammates or your fellow detectives. And you're going to want to do that because you cannot finish the game unless you've discarded at least six cards. Mm -hmm. But again, the scoring, if you keep cards that are irrelevant to the actual mystery those will deduct points from you at the end of the game as well. So you have to discard at least six. Chances are you want to discard more as you play the game because so that you don't lose those points. It's really that simple. Three cards, play one up or play one down. Share the information, a lot of talking, and then figure out 
how you answer the questions at the end. Now, Mandy, you and I played the Butler case for Mm -hmm. the Tabletop Live Network 24-hour marathon. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a really interesting one to play through where, you know, the Butler actually was the victim (laughs) that we had to solve (laughs) his murder. (laughs) The Butler didn't do it. Or did he? (laughs) (laughs) But there's a wide variety of cases. And, you know, thematically as you go through that. So mechanically, the game is super duper duper simple. Really what it comes down to is how you as a team talk through what you're seeing. Some of the cards might be a coroner's report or some of the cards might be the testimony of a witness. Oh, I was in my room from 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. Some of the cards may have a fragment of a map or a piece of evidence or a, a picture of the scene. And, and you're kind of piecing all these together. And then you go into the last 10 questions and be like, well, you know, who did it and why and things like that. But you don't know the questions until you finish the deck, which is another interesting thing about the game. Personally, I enjoy this system. It's really dependent on who I'm playing with. I do not enjoy these solo. You can play it solo. I much prefer playing this with friends where we're talking and sharing ideas and pointing things out. I think it's a much more engaging experience. It's not the type of puzzle game that I can... Like, I enjoy a lot of Unlock Solo. Mm -hmm. I I would prefer to play Sherlock Files with other people. Mm -hmm. But if you like that kind of concise mystery solving experience and you don't maybe want one of these bigger deduction games like detective right detective is a fabulous mystery game Mm -hmm. but it's it's gonna take you some time sure sure right sherlock files is there quick one hour nice communal experience interesting mysteries sometimes the questions feel a little out of left field most of the time i think they're fair i really like it mandy and i had fun playing the butler with you Now, you've Mm -hmm. played at least, I don't know if you've played other ones, but you've played The Butler with me. Right, right. What did you think of it overall? I'm on the fence about this one. I liked our experience playing it, but I think it's because I was playing it with you and, you know, we had a really engaging group online. So I think that really helped. I don't know how I feel about the system. I feel, I think my feelings about this are how people feel about the undo games. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And I almost feel like I'm comparing this to other games. And I think that's not fair because it's Mm. a different type of system. And I just don't know if maybe I'm just not comfortable with it. This is a type of game for someone like me. I have to write everything down. It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. it's a lot of text. It's a lot of cards, uh, you know, and I'm very open about this. So, you know, I have ADHD. So for me to play a lot of these games, it's hard to keep all of that information together. I don't know. I find it easier to track in an undo. I find it easier to track in an exit or a, you know, an unlocked. I find this one a bit more difficult for me. So that's a, a me thing. So I don't know if the system is going to be uh, easy to use for everyone, if that makes sense. Sure. Absolutely. So, but I don't dislike it. I just think I don't know how I feel about it yet. And I think another playthrough, like maybe of a different scenario might kind of give you a bit more insight if to see if I enjoy the game or not. So there you go, Sherlock Files, a.k.a. Sherlock, a.k.a. Did the Butler Do It? Mm. (laughs) We're going to switch gear. Now, we are recording on March 14th, three, and and in the American-style way of writing dates, we do the month first, so it's three slash 14. Oh, you do? I forgot about that. Yeah, it's an American thing. So we like to call today Pi Day. <laughs> you know what that means, Mandy? It's time oh, for yeah. some game pie. So much game pie. Brought to you by the Op Games, also known as USA Opoly. Today's featured game is Marvel Smash Up. Get ready to smash together two of your favorite things, Smash Up and Marvel. Marvel Smash Up is available now. The first officially licensed Smash Up game, the Op and AEG have partnered to bring the world of Marvel to the shuffle-building game of total awesomeness. Players work to build out their card hands and can mix and match different decks of heroes and villains, choosing from eight different factions. For a hero, and for villain. These include the Ultimates, 
Hydra, the Avengers, Masters of Evil, S.H.I.E.L.D., the Kree, Spider-Verse, and the Sinister Six. What combo will you choose? It's for two to four players, ages 12 and up, and plays in about 60 minutes. Available now at the op.games or at your local game store today. Order up! And now, it's time to order up a slice of game pie. So, everyone, here we are for some real piratey pie. Arr, arr, arr. So delicious. <laughs> That's my pirate voice. I don't know how good it is, but... <laughs> so if you didn't understand oh any of what I just said, we're doing a game pie about pirate games. <laughs> so, I... <laughs> Mandy, you're so cute. <laughs> I'm sure people will be like, Mandy, don't ever do that again. And I won't. So... <laughs> First one up. That's a lie. You totally will. You're such a liar. (laughs) Also fair. I probably will. I'll forget and be like, did I say that? (laughs) (laughs) So the first uh, slice of pie on my list is, I almost said skull pie, skull king. (laughs) And... (laughs) You skull five. Yeah, that would be very good. And this one is a trick-taking game. And I liked this one because it's a trick-taking game where the cards you play have abilities. So it affects Mm -hmm. cards as you play. Now, I'm really terrible at this game. It's trick-taking. I'm terrible at all trick-taking games. But I love trick-taking games. This is no exception. I do prefer, and I think it is the European version. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I do prefer that art over the uh, American version. And there's nothing wrong with the American version. It's just not for me. Skull King, thank you. This was uh, Dan King, uh, Game Boy Geek, who introduced me to this game. And I I absolutely love it. So Skull King, that's uh, my first slice. I love Skull King. I think that's a great choice. And actually, it's been a while since I played. And I got to get that. I wonder if it's online anywhere. We should figure that out. Anyway. (laughs) <laughs> All right. First up for me, I realized as we were going through this and planning this, Mandy, there aren't a lot mm-hmm. of roll and write games with a pirate theme. That's so huh. true. It's a gap, a thematic gap that could be solved, folks. <laughs> but there are a few, and one of them I thoroughly enjoy at least, and that is Doodle Islands. This is by Ilif Svensson and Christian Ostby, who mm. are also behind Aporta Games, who have produced some really great role and write games like Trails of Tucana mm-hmm. and Avenue and things like that. Doodle Islands is kind of a re-theme of an older role and write game that they did called Doodle City, oh. in which you're connecting different islands and pirate ships based on kind of dice drafting, mechanically very, very simple. It's engaging. You kind of have these tracks that you're scoring up. I think Doodle City was undervalued when it came out, Mm -hmm. and then Doodle Islands came out, and I think it was also kind of just slipped under the radar, unfortunately. But if you want a pirate-themed roll-and-write game with some real nice roll-and-write mechanisms, Doodle Island, check it out. I've not heard of that one, so I'm going to have to add that to my list of games that I need to purchase. It sounds fun. It's my next slice of pie. It's one... Okay. I haven't played it. I'll be straight up with you. I haven't played it in a long time, uh, but I do remember when I played it, it was really good. So that is Port Royale, and it's a card game. So I played this during lunch hours when you know we were able to play games during lunch, and it does have that kind of, well, no, the cover of the box literally has a pirate on it, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a card game, like I mentioned, and it's a game where you can actually attack and it's based on, you know, swords that you have on cards. You have an uh, expedition, I think, type action, which you can complete if you have the required items to do so. Uh, they have things like a tax increase, which forces you to so discard. So thematic. Right? It's so thematic. So things like that, which plays into the pirate theme. But it doesn't have that kind of, like, our negative pirate feel to it. I don't know. It was, like, a nice, easy game. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say easy. I was going to say easy breezy in the fact that I could play it during a lunch break, but it's a toughie. So Port Royale is one I definitely think you should try uh, if you have not. Yeah. And I mean, a couple of things. This is an Alexander Pfister card game. How did I forget that? So important. Yeah. Yes. I love Alexander Pfister card games. Tiber the Builder. Yeah. So right? good. So good. These are good. Oh, my goods. Port Royale. I think I like all of Fister's card games, actually. Actually, that's true. I own them all, own all the bits. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and 
this is from Pegasus Spiel, but Steve Jackson also published it in North America. So did they really? Good, I didn't nice. know that because I got my copy at, uh, in Germany. Okay, good to know. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New art and everything. Next on my list is Francis Drake. Francis Drake is a heavier, deeper kind of Euro style game. It's got a lot going on. It's got set collection. It's worker placement. You've got pirates rolling around. The thing that I really, really enjoy about Francis Drake mechanically is it's got this action track that you're going around. And it's one of those that you can go as far ahead in the track as you want to, but you can never go backwards. Mm -hmm. So there's some really interesting strategic decisions as you go down that track that I like. But hey, it's about Francis Drake exploring the sea, gathering up resources, dealing with a pirate ship that's marauding around. I don't know if it's super heavy Into the pirate theme. I don't know if you want to call Francis Drake a pirate. I know some people might want to. Uh, But I love this game. It's, you know, in in context, it's a little bit older at this point. But it really, really holds up if you like that heavier style Euro game. And that's why Francis Drake is in my piratey pie. (laughs) Well, my next one. Well, I mean, this is no surprise. I've been talking about it quite a bit, as has Suzanne. Forbidden Waters. So this is definitely... Very piratey. I mean, I think we talked about it on the episode that Eric was on. Pantless Patty is just, in, you know, burned in my <laughs> brain <laughs> from Forbidden Waters. I don't know why, but this is a great, you know, would you say like RPG light? I guess you could say it's a story like sure. elements to it, you know? So being the pirate is, you know, that's great. And you're kind of following that story and trying to make decisions to, you know, get to the objective without, without expiring you and your crew (laughs) so we'll go with that but it is definitely on the lengthier side but you don't even notice the time because you're having so much fun i love the the voice voiceover the application that they have that allows you to to use the voices for the reading the text and very immersive experience so forbidden waters really enjoy it looking forward to new stuff coming out uh yeah i i wouldn't say we had a little tug of war over who got to the list forbidden waters but (laughs) a hundred percent would have put forbidden waters on my slice if you hadn't captured it, Mandy. So I'm glad you brought it up. Absolutely. My next slice of pirate pie, perhaps a little bit of an oddity for some of us, but it's Rataneer. Rataneer hmm. is a game by Hizashi Hiyashi, published by Akazu Brand, and flat out not available in the US that oh, okay. I know of. Okay. I had to import this one. It's not inherently in English. But it's playable in English in terms of uh, it being fairly language independent from the game components and things like that. Ratanier is a game about rat pirates. So, (laughs) you know, the art is all little mice and things like that. So it's very, very cute. But mechanically, Ratanier is a really satisfying game with simultaneous action selection and resource management as you're going down this journey board and gathering cargo and all this other stuff. This is a really good game. I remember when we played Ratnir the first time, one of the things we said was, this feels like Yokohama Light. Mm, Okay. And it, it really is. There is some great gameplay in Ratanier. I really wish, quite frankly, that it had made it over because it's a solid, solid game. Mm-hmm. And hey, mouse pirates. That's great. I'm just picturing it now. <laughs> Not heard of this. Very it sounds cute. Not that I ever thought I'd say a pirate was cute, but here we are. Yeah, it's it's a it's a good one. Okay. Something to check out. You'd have to you have to show it to me. So my last slice of pie is Libertalia. And I know I've talked about this on the podcast under a shelf staple maybe a few moons ago. Uh, I haven't played this one again for a long time, but it was one I played a lot when I first got it. So it's another pirate kind of card game. I mean, you have a board and whatnot, but you have cards that are numbered. And depending on sequence of, you know, like if you play a higher number versus a lower number will dictate on who goes first and being, you know, on the board and getting all the good things. And Libertalia is one of those ones. I think most people have this in their collection already, so it's probably not a surprise. But if you haven't, definitely one I think you would enjoy. And I think a lot of people, could you play this with families? I don't think there's anything in there that would be negative. As long as you're okay with the theme, but yeah, it's not super, I don't know, like 
angry, violent okay. pirate kind right. of stuff. Right? Uh, yeah, I yeah. want to make sure before I say that. So Libertalia, it's one, if you haven't tried, it's one that's been out for a long time, but uh, a lot of fun. So give it a go. And, right, that's Palomori, isn't it? Is it? I think so. I think so, yeah. That's some good design chops right there. <laughs> and to wrap up our pirate game pie, this was one that we had a little bit of a tug of war, too, on yes. whose list it went on. The 2020 American Tabletop Awards Casual Game of the Year, Rob Davio's Ship Shape. Ship Shape. Love it. <laughs> Published by Calliope Games. This is a game, Mandy, actually, as you were talking about Dive, mm -hmm. the part of the reason why I got kind of excited about Dive oh. is as you were talking about it, it reminded me a little of Ship Shape. It's funny that you say that. It oh, totally does. I didn't even put the connection together. Okay. Yeah. Where you get these tiles that represent layers of your ship or your cargo hold. And part of the game is you're looking down these tiles to try to figure out how which tile you want to get to place in your boat so that you can cover up the rats and expose as much treasure as you can get and make sure you have cannons to protect yourself and all that good stuff. And you do this with card bidding where you have a handful of pirates and you play them and they have different strengths and that'll determine the order of how you get these tiles. I don't know what it is about this game, but I love it so, so much. The combination of that unique mechanism of looking down this stack of tiles, the puzzly nature of getting the tiles on your ship, the bidding with the cards and keeping track of what opponents have played and trying to gauge how strong you want to go or wait, no, I don't want that top tile. So I want to be weaker, but not too weak. And I think it plays up to six. Oh, yeah. So which, great player count. Yeah, I love the player count range as well. Rob Davio, Ship Shape, an absolutely fabulous piratey game that everybody <laughs> should check out. And I remember when you talked about it, I was like, okay, another pirate game. Yeah, all right. We'll see what this is about. And I was like, what? I love it. It's so good. So, yeah, this is definitely one out of all the things on the list here. I mean, all the games we listed are fantastic. This is one I 100% say that you need to try this one. At least this one of any, if you don't try any of the other ones. So good. Ship Shape is awesome. Next next time we do Pirate Game Pie, maybe we should time it with Talk Like a Pirate Day. I just realized there is a Talk Like a Pirate Day and we... Didn't time this well at all. Oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> Darn it. Uh, someday we'll be better at this. Opportunity for more pirate things, so. <laughs> <laughs> all righty, folks. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. Thanks, everybody, who's been sending in questions. We'll do a Q&A section soon. Sometimes we reply directly, and sometimes we just save them up for the show. So keep those coming in. Email us your suggestions for Game Pie as well. You can reach me at Suzanne at Dicetower.com. And you can reach me at Mandy. That's Mandy with an I at Dicetower.com. I will point out that one of the funniest things is, is that some folks who email Mandy and I at the same time <laughs> I'll get, we'll get that, you know, hi, Suzanne and Mandy with an I, and they'll literally type out <laughs> Mandy it. with an I, and I think that's it's so working. funny. It's working. <laughs> you got, you're, you're nailing it, Mandy. As always, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be part of your extended gaming family. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the podcast. Let us know your favorite pirate games that we may have missed on our game pie. I don't mind hearing that. I'm always open to another pirate game. Absolutely. I think I, the way the, the amount of pirate games available, definitely think there could be a part two. Next episode, don't forget to tune in for Tom and Eric as they talk about the best of 2006, hmm. which is 15 years ago. Wow. Long time. There you go. <laughs> Until next time, everyone, I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Andy Hutchinson. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassal.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, 
Mandy and Eric, with assistance from Roy Canaday and Rob Searing. Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at boardgamegeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at podcast at dicetower.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. everyone it's that time again so for two truths and a lie i'm gonna go first with mine from last episode so i own wits and wagers epic geek i own wits and wagers las vegas and i own wits and wagers deluxe if you said that i own wits and wagers epic geek was the lie you would be correct and i'm actually a little sad that i don't because i have yeah, for all, reals. all the wits and wagers <laughs> we'll have to correct that for you mate. absolutely yes last episode I said I like Colbert and the card game better than the board game I like Castles of Burgundy the dice game better than the board game and I like Broom Service the card game better than the board game and the lie is that I like Castles of Burgundy the dice game better than the board game I do really like Castles of Burgundy the dice game but not better than that classic classic game Tricky. But the other one's Tricky. really good. Tricky wiki there, Suzanne. <laughs> 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 All right. So new for this episode. Here we go. I had to do it a little differently. So bear with me on this one. Delicatus is a type of apple. Beauty of Bath is a type of apple. And Einstein is a type of apple. You're quizzing us. Darn You're tootin'. turning two truths and lie to a quiz. I like it. Darn two. And my family's been on a snack food fix. So this week, I like the Lady Gaga Oreos. I like the Brookie-O Oreos. And I like the Dark Chocolate Oreos. That's a lot of Oreos. (laughs) Good luck, everyone. Beetlejuice. It's showtime.